Good morning, everyone. And a very warm welcome to our service of worship here in First Church. We'd like to welcome Mary McCabe with us today, who will be singing for us. And we'd like to welcome those people who are joining with us online. Uh, I say hopefully you can hear us. I say hopefully because we've got a new mic uh, this morning. And uh, as with all technology, it has a bit of a mind of its own. And I hope it's working. And the only way we can really test it is uh, by finding out after the service whether it's worked or not. Just a couple of announcements. Just firstly, to remind the committee that we meet this Tuesday at half past seven in Central Hall. Um, please be aware that social distancing and all the various other things uh, will be observed when we meet uh, this Tuesday at half seven. And just to remind you that there are copies of the newsletter available uh, still in the vestibule if you haven't uh, picked one up or downloaded it from the website. Um, I think, oh, and just to say today that the flowers today have been donated by Maureen Purdy and Billy Kirk in memory of their mother, so we're very grateful to them for that. And also to just say thank you to Rosemary Swan, who is giving up doing the church flowers after many years of service there. Uh, she's provided arrangements for the um, vestibule and the windows and Christmas and various high days and holidays here in the church, as well as on a regular uh, Sunday basis, uh, provide, you know, using the donations provided by people. So thank you very much to Rosemary for all her hard work and her commitment um, to, to the flowers here in the church. I think these are all the announcements. Come, let us worship God, God who is mystery, God who is not contained by any one religious system, God who is certainly not contained by our minds and hearts. Come, let us worship God, God who wills dignity for every family and every person, God who lies at the heart of each life and speaks to the depth of each heart, God who is constant adventure constant movement, constant presence. Come, let us worship God. Let us be filled with awe and wonder and that profound grace seen in Jesus the carpenter. Now we join together in prayer. Let us make sure that we are here as our whole selves. If we think there are parts of our lives that you know nothing of, forgive us, O oh God. If there are parts of ourselves that we pretend do not exist, disabuse us of such an idea. If we think that there was anything that any, any way that anything we have done would mean that we were excluded from your presence, forgive us. O oh God, as your people in all our perfections, we come to you. God of love, we know that you forgive us. God of justice, we know you demand more from us. God of kindliness, we know that you would guide us. God, we have met you this week in the shout for help and the offer of an extended palm, in the whisper of comfort and the wise printed word, in the breathtaking sunset and the sunlight on a puddle, we, your ordinary people, have lives touched with eternity. And so we praise you for your interest in us and your greatness beyond us. God, our Saviour, peace to you. God, our Creator, gratitude to you. God, our Empowerer, thanks to you. And we pray the words of Jesus when he said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
morning. There has been a lot of talk in the media during the past week about a survey carried out north and south of the border about the future of Ireland. Well, some 240 years ago, our former member William Drennan had his own ideas. So I thought it might be interesting to read a little about his life and see how things have changed or not changed. The term the Emerald Isle is synonymous with Ireland and its rolling hills and vales of green. But how did Ireland come to be known as the Emerald Isle? The first time the words ever appeared in print in reference to Ireland was in a poem by Belfast-born William Drennan titled When Erin First Rose. Drennan, a poet, a physician, and a political radical who helped to form the Society of United Irishmen, was born in Belfast in 1754. His father was the Reverend Thomas Drennan, minister of Belfast's First Presbyterian Church. After studying in Scotland, Drennan returned to Belfast in 1778 and set up an obstetrics practice. He was known for being a medical innovator, urging for simple but effective measures such as hand washing to prevent the spread of disease and of inoculation against smallpox. In the early 1980s, he began a publishing uh, creative and political works and became known for his support of Catholic emancipation and civil rights. He moved to Dublin in 1789 and in 1791 he and his brother-in-law Sam McTeer, who was also a member of First Presbyterian Church, developed a plan for the Society of the United Irishmen. As they exchanged letters, they envisioned a benevolent conspiracy, a plot for the people, a brotherhood with the rights of man, and the greatest happiness of the greatest number, its end. Its general end, real independence to Ireland, and republicanism, its particular purpose. Its business, every means to accomplish these ends as speedily as the prejudices and the bigotry of the land we live in would permit. As the society grew, Drennan became its leading force in Dublin and stood trial for libel in 1794. But by 1798, the year of the rebellion, he had parted ways with the society as its emphasis shifted to rebellion and violent uprising. Dr. Drennan retired from the medical profession and returned to his native Belfast in 1807. There he founded the Belfast Monthly Magazine and became involved in setting up the Belfast Academical Institution, one of the first attempts at educating Protestants and Catholics together for secondary and higher level education. It's interesting to note that following the Act of Union in 1801, the attitude of Belfast's radical Presbyterians changed. And in 1811, Drennan wrote in the Belfast Monthly Magazine, be Britons with all your souls and forget your father called himself an Irishman. <laughs> when Drennan died in 1820, in a final symbolic gesture, he had insisted his coffin be carried by three Protestants and three Catholics to his final resting place.
Our thanks to Des and to Mary and Richard for being part of our service uh, this morning. Our second reading comes from John's Gospel, chapter 15, reading verses 9 to 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that you, uh, your joy may be in you, so that my joy, sorry, may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Theology can never begin by assuming it already has the answer. Any theology that does not begin with radical doubt is basically dishonest. So says the biblical scholar Brandon Scott, I think I quoted him a few weeks ago in a sermon. And that's a statement which is not only challenging to all of us who engage in theological or biblical discussion, but also personally challenging. As I remember another older saying, that the first word in religion must always be no. No to all the nonsense that often goes under the name of religion. So there is space to say yes to the more profound insights of all the best in religions. And as Brandon Scott also reminds us, our faith is not a single moment of coming to faith or conversion, but an ongoing activity or process. He says our faith grows and develops in response to our concrete experience. But we need faith for what we don't know or can't know. Faith is a gamble about what might be, not what certainly is. But it it can be hard to say no when the politics and interpretations from the past or the church bureaucracy of the present have framed or shaped a story in a particular way. That's because for 2,000 years there's been this big contradiction between the religion of Jesus and the religion about Jesus. The religion of Jesus is found in the things he talked to people about, about how to live, how to treat one another, how you can be made whole in the here and now, how you can help make the world more whole in the here and now. He was always constantly pressing at the margins for justice and empowerment as he ate with tax collectors and prostitutes, as he called the poor blessed, and as he praised the confessions of the common people. The religion about Jesus is about believing a certain story, often aimed at frightening people into accepting agendas such as hating gay and lesbian people, or being suspicious of independent women, or the sanctioning of torture against so-called Middle Eastern terrorists. And coupled with that is the promise that if you do believe, you will be saved after you die. It is my humble opinion that Jesus would have hated that story. He would have said no to that story. And today we have one of those work-in-progress stories as our Gospel reading. And you will have recognized that it is a story about love. But not the celebrity love story that fills the tabloids and clickbait of the internet. Or the sentimental love stories 
that you find in Hallmark cards. But it is a love story which has inspired John, our storyteller, to both tell it and to wrap it around the name of Jesus. And it's a story where love isn't a noun, but a verb. So let me tell a story in reply. A story about love as a verb and not a noun. A monk, Friar Bernard, lamented in his cell on the crimes of humankind. Rising one morning before daybreak from his bed of moss and dry leaves, he gnawed at his roots and berries and drank at the spring and set forth to go to Rome to reform the corrupt people there. And on his way he encountered many travellers who greeted him courteously. And the cabins of peasants and the castles of lords supplied his few wants. And when he came at last to Rome, his piety and goodwill easily introduced him to many families of the rich. On the first day, he saw and talked with mothers with young babies. They told him how much love they bore their children and how they were perplexed in their daily walk lest they should fall, fail in their duty to them. What, he said, and this on rich embroidered carpets, on marble floors, surrounded by expensive sculpture and carved wood, rich, rich pictures and piles of books about you. You are rich Roman pagans, not even Christians. How can you be good people? Look at our pictures and books, they said, and we will tell you, good brother, how we spent last evening. These books are full of stories of godly children and holy families and sacrifices made in old or in recent times by great and not so great people. And last evening our families were all gathered together and our husbands and brothers spoke sadly on what we could save and give to others in these hard times. Then the men came in and they said, Greetings, good brother. Does your monastery need anything? Let us share with you. Then Friar Bernard went home swiftly with other thoughts than he, than he had brought, saying to himself, their way of life is wrong. They are not even poor and they are not Christians, yet these Romans whom I prayed to God to destroy are filled with love. Friar Bernard has a couple of choices. He can try to forget what he has seen and felt and return to the monastery and to his comfortable beliefs. Or he can realize that his beliefs are too small to hold life or even to serve in a way that isn't a curse to other people. What does it take to let love thrive and become alive? Love of the kind our, our gospel storyteller is talking about is a verb rather than a noun. It creates a whole, a harmony, a unity, which is, does not diminish or weaken, but expands our life force, encouraging a response and expressions of joy. And it is greeted in open and honest ways that can lead us towards life more abundant. Theodore Parker, the Unitarian reformer of early 19th century America, once wrote towards the end of his life, I have had great powers and have only half used them. We all have great powers that we have only half used. And isn't that one reason we come here Sunday after Sunday? to keep being exhorted to develop the other half of our great powers and to use them to help ourselves and our world become fully alive. We come here seeking wholeness and so often we don't want to admit that if we only will, we can have it. I'll leave you with a story, apparently true, that illustrates that love 
while well-intentioned, never finds its true home unless it is followed through. When 67-year-old carpenter Russell Herman died in 1994, his will included a staggering set of bequests. Included in his will was a plan for distribution of more than $2 billion for the city of East St. Louis, another billion and a half for the state of Illinois, two and a half billion for the National Forest System, and to top off the list, Herman left $6 trillion to the government to help pay off the national debt. And that sounds amazingly generous, but there was a small problem. Herman's only asset when he died was a 1983 Buick. He made grand pronouncements, but there was no real generosity involved. His promises were meaningless because there was nothing to back them up. I am giving you these commands, said Jesus, so that you may love one another. No half measures, no life half completed. Amen.
Again, we join together in prayer. When we hear the voices of self-doubt telling us that we are worthless, that we are weak and can do nothing and change is beyond our grasp, God, who has made us in your image, give us the power of your spirit to learn and grow and to work with you towards a new creation. When the vulnerable are exploited and the trust of the innocent betrayed, when the strong seem invincible and the weak have nowhere to turn, God, who sides with the poor, give us the power of your spirit to resist evil and to work with you towards a new creation. In a world crying out for peace, where conflicts seemed hardened into steel, where war and poverty uproot families and homes, and those seeking refuge are treated as criminals. God, who made the world to be one, give us the power of your spirit to struggle for justice and to work with you towards a new creation. In a church that is sometimes afraid of difference and sets up barriers against the outside, where people are fearful of change, clinging to outworn ways. God, who calls us to be your people, give us the power of your spirit to witness for you, to let us be a vision for a better world, and to work with you towards a new creation. Amen. Living God, the source of all life, prompt us into new beginnings. 
ever-present God traveling alongside us, guide us to walk in your way. Ever-loving God surrounding us with care, help us to detect your presence this day and forevermore. Amen.